this whole thing about does it really matter if Mary was a, uh, was a virgin or not? I'm going to start in Luke chapter 1. I know I told you, you know, Matthew chapter 1, but Luke chapter 1, I have a, a verse 66 says this. It says, And all they that heard, uh, heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, What manner of child shall this be? And the, Lord, uh, and the hand of the Lord was with him. Matthew chapter 1, starting at verse 18. I told you to be in Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, it's up on the screen as well. It says this, Now the, the birth of Jesus was on the wise, when as his mother was espoused to Joseph. The word espoused means that, she, uh, you know, that you know, they were engaged, that, you know, that she was his fiancée, that Joseph's fiancée. And despite modern you know, thought and belief on this, that when it says that a person, you know, was, you know, that this person is a, a fiancé, that they're engaged, they did not have marital relations until they're after, after they were married, okay? I know that's, you know, an, uh, you know, an old-fashioned idea, but, you know, that's a Bible idea. The Bible says, you know, for us not to have marital relations before we're married. It says to keep the marriage bed undefiled, okay? It says not to have that physical relationship until you're married, and so it says, uh, Mary was espoused to Joseph before they came together. She was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Drop down to verse 21. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Drop down to verse 23. Behold, a virgin shall uh, be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his, his name Emmanuel which being uh, interpreted is God with us. Verse 25, and, know, uh, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and, she, uh, and he called his name Jesus. And so what we see through this entire thing over and over again, you know, so far is the fact that they're making a very distinct, you know, a thing known that he was not with her physically, you know, uh, you know in a marriage fashion until until Jesus was born, okay, to make sure that that's known. And so the Gospel of Matthew gives us another reason to be thankful. The events associated with uh, the birth of Jesus fulfilled numerous Old Testament prophecies given centuries before the event they described. In Matthew, uh, chapter, uh, one, uh, sorry, Matthew chapter 1, verse 22, it introduces a common statement in his work. He wrote, now all that all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying. That's what he, oftentimes uh, in Matthew, that's what he will say. That this has been done, meaning it's done, right? That it, you know, that it might be, uh, you know, that it would be fulfilled or that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. He's going to go back over and over again. Why? Because he's proving over and over that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is the Christ. Amen? And so that's what he is trying to prove. That's what he's showing. He's not trying to prove. He's saying, you know what? This was said centuries before. I'm just you're reminding you that it was already fulfilled. And you know what? It is fulfilled in, the, in, in Jesus Christ. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that the seed of your word would find fertile soil upon our hearts. Lord, I pray that you would fill me with the Holy Spirit, that you would lead, guide, and direct this message, that, Lord, that we would appreciate your, uh, the account, the story of your birth upon this earth. And so, Lord, I thank you for what you're going to do. And, Lord, we know that just because you were born 2,000 years ago does not mean that that's the moment that you came into existence because you have always been, you always will, and you always ever will be. And so, Lord, we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. So, like I said, he uses this, this similar say, uh, saying at least a dozen times, if not more, in the Gospel of Matthew. He says it over and over again. He wants you to realize that what happened in the New Testament wasn't, or sorry, what happened in the Old Testament wasn't just spoken and forgotten about. That it wasn't just some random words, because every word in the Old Testament actually alludes to Jesus Christ coming in the New Testament. Every, if you want to look at it this way, the Old Testament is like the meat of the Bible, and the New Testament is the, uh, is the commentary. It's explaining it, because Jesus Christ was always supposed to come. 
He was always there. He always has been. He always is, and he always will be. Jesus Christ, no matter what, the way we want to look at it, because some people will say, well, Jesus was just born. He came into existence on Christmas Day. No, he has always been. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen? Amen. And so the, here are some of the prophecies that were fulfilled at his birth. First, uh, the first use of the fulfillment uh, phrase that I just spoke about introduces one of the most notable and best known prophecies in the Bible. It says in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, which I had just read, it says, Behold, a virgin shall be with child. Now, if just that little part right there, you say, well, that seems impossible because a virgin cannot give birth to a child. It can if the Holy Spirit is involved. Amen? Amen? And so that part right there, that's the part that they're trying to take out. They want to take out that part that says a virgin. They would, you know, some, actually, some you know, uh, modern translations of the Bible will say, you know, it says a woman shall give, you know, shall give birth. Or shall, have, you know, shall be with child. So they're trying to remove that fact of virgin because they'll say, well, that's a little bit hard to believe. That's a little bit hard to believe, and so uh, we don't want to go along with that. We don't, you know, we don't want people to be turned off to the gospel. We don't want people to be turned off by these fairy tales, as they'll say. But it goes on to say, it says, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is being interpreted, uh, which, is being, uh, which being interpreted is God with us. This fulfills the prophecy in Isaiah chapter 7. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, it says this. It says, Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. So right there, you know, Isaiah prophesied this 700 years prior. He prophesied about this 700 years prior to it happening. He's, and Matthew is going back and saying, you know what, this is, this is, what, this is what just happened. This, this just happened, that a virgin shall be with child, and she's going to bring forth a son, and they're going to call him Emmanuel. And some people say, well, his name's not Emmanuel. Well, what it's alluding to is, it's alluding to the fact that what it means. Emmanuel means God with us, which in John chapter 1, verse 14, it says this, and the word was made flesh. Okay? The word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of all, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So it's alluding to the fact of that God is with us. And what does it say? The word became flesh. How did he become flesh? He was born, uh, he was born in a manger 2,000 years ago. That Jesus Christ, God, was born 2,000 years ago. And it's not just the fact that he's God. He was 100% God, but he's also 100% man. Because he's in all, he was in always tempted as we are, yet was without sin. Only, who can only do that? Jesus Christ, you know, the Son of God, can do that. And so Emmanuel, like I said, is a proper title for Jesus Christ because he was God as well as man and dwelt among the sons of men. After, uh, after Christ's birth, the wise men arrived in Jerusalem. And we, you know, we talk about them, you know, the magi, uh, you know, the wise men. And uh, Herod gathered because he had heard about this prophecy. Herod had heard about the prophecy that there was going to be a born a king. And Herod is very paranoid, to say the least. He's, he doesn't want anything taking away from him. It's all about him. He doesn't want any upheaval or anything else. He's like, I'm king. I want to remain king. So Herod gathered the chief priests and the scribes and asked them where the Messiah was going to be born. And we know that he, it wasn't because he wanted to go over and say, I want to go worship, you know, God. I want to go worship the Christ child. No, he wanted to go over to find it so he can kill. So that way he could still be king. Because all of, for him, it's all about the kingdom here on earth. He has no idea, whereas we see throughout the entire gospels, all the gospels, is that everybody is about the kingdom here on earth. They're not about the spiritual kingdom, the heavenly kingdom. They're worried about how they look here on earth, but they're not worried about the fact of how they're going to get to heaven. They don't care about that. They care about how people look at them here. Kind of like nowadays where you see people who have money, they want to control the people who don't have money. They want to tell them what they're going to do and how they're going to move and all that kind of stuff, you know, how much you can do and how much you can, uh, all this other stuff. I mean, there's weird laws that are coming out now. Like, I think of one, 
you know, I go out, you know, I go out hunting, and I, and I just ask myself this question because my family lives in Illinois. And one of the laws that they're trying to pass, they're trying to say, there's no reason for you to go out hunting and have all those bullets in the gun. You only need one bullet. And it, it, it's not supposed to be placed in your gun ready to shoot. What's supposed to happen is that when a deer or whatever, I go deer hunt, that's why I'm going to say deer. So what ends up happening, you know, in their minds is saying, you're out hunting, you pull out the bu- a bullet like Barney Fife, maybe from your front pocket, I mean, he's got a little green on it. You place it in there, you cock it, waiting for that deer to stay there, okay, because he's supposed to listen, just like there's some people that believe that when you see a deer crossing sign, that the deer can only pass at that sign. And you laugh, but it's true. There, are a bit, there was a lady that sued, tried to sue a city because they said, well, this deer jumped out, and you know what? The sign was back there. Okay, so you put it in their pocket, then get up there and shoot it and hope that you drop it right where it's at. Because any hunter knows whether you go bow hunting, whether you go rifle hunting, whether you go shotgun, whether you go musket, you're going to need another, probably another shot. Because they don't necessarily go down on that first shot, okay? But that's like the, you know, the, the, the foolishness that we see you know, in, this, in this whole thing. And the thing is, is that that's what people want to believe. But what we see you know, along you know, with, that, you know, with that is like these foolish laws, these, these foolish things, because we know what's going to happen later with Herod. His foolish law was if you had a child that was between, the, you know, between certain ages, between uh, ages two to five, you, uh, you know, they need to be put to death. And it's not just a child, it's a boy. So if, it's, you know, if there's a boy that's between the ages of two to five, you've got to put it to death. Why? Because he's so paranoid that he says, you know what, I don't want to take any chances. And he wants, you know, he wants to have them murdered. So, they, so uh, like I said, um, Isaiah, these ones are going to be responding to Old Testament prophecies pinpointing where Jesus Christ was going to be born. Where was he born? Bethlehem. And the wise men, because they are wise, figure out what Herod actually wants to do and what do they do? They don't tell him where he's actually at, right? Matthew chapter 6, verse, or sorry, Matthew chapter 2, verse 6, it says, And thou Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah? For out of thee shall come a governor that, sh- uh, that shall rule my people Israel. This fulfills a prophecy in Micah, chapter 5, verse 2. It says this, But thou, Bethlehem, uh, uh, though thou be a little among the thousands of, of uh, Judah, yet out of thee shall, uh, shall he come forth unto me, that is, to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. And so what we see is, obviously, it's telling us over and over again where he's going to be born, which is in Bethlehem. And John chapter 7, verse 42, even uh, talks about it. It says, Hath not the scripture said that Christ cometh out of the seed of David, out of the town of Bethlehem, where David was? And so we see these prophecies being continually fulfilled over and over and over again, uh, just about his birth. Like I said, the fact is, is that Herod, in his murderous response to the slaughtering of young boys of Jerusalem, or sorry, of Bethlehem, led to the fulfillment of, of three more prophecies. Because the wise men had told him where he was going to be born, so he starts killing off all these other ones. But because he does that, he fulfill, uh, he helps fulfill three more prophecies, along with it. First is uh, one of the first is the tragic massacre. Fulfilled in the uh, fulfilled with the uh, fulfilled with the words of Jeremiah, in Jeremiah chapter thirty-one, verse fifteen, it says, "Thus saith the Lord: A voice was heard in in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping, Rahel, uh, weeping uh, for her uh, children, refused to be uh, comforted uh, for her uh, for her children because they were not, and so." We see, uh, obviously, this is a foreshadowing of what we see in Matthew chapter 2, verse 18. Matthew chapter 2, verse 18, it says, In Ramah there was a, a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and would be, com- uh, would be comforted because they were not, because they are not. 
So what we see in here is this, is that um, that's at the time where all the children were being massacred, were being killed, the boy uh, children because of this. And so um, we, that's, that's the first one. The second one, the second fulfilled prophecy resulting from Herod's uh, you know, paranoid rage took place after Joseph uh, took Mary and uh, took Mary and and Jesus to Egypt upon their return, and uh, uh, God's words to Hosea were fulfilled when it said this. Hosea said this. He says uh, in Hosea chapter one, eleven, verse one, it says, uh, "Called my son out of Egypt." So, because of the fact that he's massacring the children over in Bethlehem, over in that area, Mary and Joseph go down to Egypt, and so he says that in Hosea. Uh, 11 chapter uh, chapter 11 verse 1 that says that you're going to call him out of Egypt because he goes down there for a period of time just like Matthew chapter 2 verse 15 says out of Egypt have I called my son ladies in the back stop being disrespectful and pay attention sorry about that but some things need to be taken care of. This prophecy was originally made as a, uh, a statement of history. God had, uh, had uh, called and brought Israel out of Egypt. And he was guided by the Holy Spirit, and Matthew used the words to refer to the Messiah. So, in other words, he is sitting there, and he is telling, he is telling you exactly what is going to happen. So, because of that, we have, we have the one in, that is referring to the massacre of the children. The other one is the fact of because of the massacre of the children, what ends up happening is that they go down to Egypt. And then the final prophecy that is given uh, because of Herod's you know, uh, you know, paranoia is this. is discussed by Matthew pertaining to the events in the, the uh, early years of, of Jesus uh, has to do with his boyhood home. God warned Joseph in a dream not to go back to Judea, uh, so instead he took Mary and Jesus to Nazareth in Galilee. So in Matthew chapter 2, verse 23, we see this. It says, And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. And so some, you know... Uh, some people look at it and say, well, he was not a Nazarene. He was from Bethlehem. So how is it because he was a Nazarene? Well, some believe because of the fact that, um, be, because of the fact that he had come from there. So in other words, like, you know, say for us, I was, born, you know, I was born in Waukegan, Illinois. We were youth pastors in Peoria, Illinois. Some people you know, could say that we came from Waukegan. Some would say that we came from Peoria. It depends on which context you're talking about you know, in life. And so we look at this as I said, uh, because it's also looked at, uh, you know, the fact that Nazareth was looked upon with scorn. Nazareth was not looked at as being, you know, the place to live, the place to be. We see this in, uh, in John chapter 1, verse 46, where it says, uh, even Nathanael had asked, can there, any go- uh, can, can there any good come out of Nazareth? So we know from that statement that Nazareth was not looked at as being like the, the place to live, the place to be. So several prophets revealed that the Messiah would be what? Despised and rejected of men. We know this. We know this from Isaiah 53. We know this from Psalm 22. We know this from Zechariah 12, that he was going to be despised and rejected of men. And what better place to have him you know, uh, say that he's coming from is Nazareth. Because Nazareth was not looked at a, 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 as a place of, of great rapport or where a king would come from. Because remember, people back then, you know, the ones that didn't believe on the Lord or wouldn't believe on the Lord, they were telling people that, you know, he was going to come, that he was going to come in, you know, in this big, huge, you know, uh, grand ceremony that people were all going to know. And Jesus did the opposite. He came in the form of, you know, of a baby in a, you know, a quiet, humble place, just as the Word of God said that he would. But the reason, you know, which goes along with the, uh, the idea of the fact that you had the scribes and the Pharisees, you know, come over there and tell Jesus all these different things and whatever, trying to teach Jesus what he believes. And what did Jesus say? He says, search the scripture, for the scripture testifies of me. And if they would have searched the scripture, like Jesus had said, they would have found that it was testifying to Jesus Christ. 
that it was not testifying to some magnificent, grand, you know, ceremony, but everything that was prophesied before, God told them exactly how it was going to happen, and they didn't want to believe it. They would rather believe that he was going to come and overthrow the government of Rome than to overthrow the powers of darkness and sin and hell in the grave. Because to them, popularity and being famous was more uh, important to them than going to heaven. That's, pretty, that's, pretty, uh, that's a pretty tragic thing, isn't it? That they would think that you know, popularity and being famous and having money here was more important than getting to heaven and being with Jesus Christ forever and ever, who owns the, uh, you know, uh, the cattle on a thousand hills. Amen? So plus, you know, obviously, uh, Jesus, you know, like I said, he had lived there for a period of time, so that's what it is. So going back to my original question, does it really matter if Mary was a virgin or not? I wanted to go through some of those prophecies first, you know, that were fulfilled already at his birth, but I want to, you know, like I said, spend more time on this, and I already gave you the answer. Does it really matter? Yes, it does matter. It does matter that she was a virgin. Because if we believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, which people say that that's impossible, because you can't bring yourself back from the dead, right? If the Bible teaches that, the Bible teaches the death, burial, and resurrection, and that's the foundation of our faith, how much more is, you know, uh, should we believe that he was born of a virgin? Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it states this in verse 12. It says, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some, uh, some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then, uh, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ uh, be not risen, then is our preaching in vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and... We, also, we are found false witnesses of God. So in other words, he's saying your faith is vain, but we are false witnesses if Jesus Christ did not raise from the dead. It says, because we have testified of God that raised up Christ, whom, uh, whom he ra- uh, raised not up, if so, be that the dead raised not. Excuse me. For if... The dead raise not, then Christ is not raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, and ye are yet in your sins. In other words, what is he's he's telling us flat out that your faith is vain, that it's of no effect, there's no purpose to it. You know what, you might as well just go live on your life. And he goes, and plus, you're still in your sins. Because what did his death, burial, and resurrection accomplish? What did that sacrifice of the pure, spotless lamb accomplish? The forgiveness of sins. So if that didn't, if Jesus Christ did not raise from the dead, as they said it, he says, you know what, you're still in your sins. Because you're just like every other false god out there. Because every other false god, they talk about how they were born, not of a virgin, and how they died, but they, they never raised from the dead. So all the other false gods that are out there, all these false other teachers that have come out, they're, they're where? They're st- their body is still in the ground, and their soul is still in hell. And so he's saying, you know what? If Jesus Christ did not raise from the dead, that, we could say the same thing about Jesus, but that's not true, because Jesus Christ did raise from the dead, and we, are, we no longer are in our sins. Why? Because we are clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Amen? If one prophecy is not true, or fabricated, then what about the other prophecies? What can we do with that? What can we do with all the other prophecies? Where do we go from there? Where does it stop? It doesn't. Because if you say that one prophecy is false or one uh, prophecy is fabricated, then all of them could be fabricated. And why do we believe this book? We might as well store it away and just go live our lives. As the Bible says, go eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we shall die. We can call into question every other prophecy, and actually we can call into question the entire Bible if one is fabricated, if one is not true, if one is, you know, is looked at as being, oh, that's a nice little fairy tale. And don't we have that nowadays? I think for one, obviously, you know, uh, the different religions like Islam and everything else, they'll look at 
you know, the Bible as a bunch of fairy tales. Those are you know, a bunch of nice stories that we have. The Jewish people are the same, and you say the Jewish people should know. Because why? Because the Bible was given to the Jew first, then to the Gentile. And what did they do with it? They were supposed to be the light on a hill, and they were not. They didn't do what God had asked them to do. And they go around now, the Bible says, because of the fact that they wanted Jesus Christ dead, they didn't want to believe in the gospel, they didn't want to believe that God could save them from their sins, that, that Jesus Christ, who was standing right in front of them, could save them from their sins, they said, you know what? Crucify him and let his blood be upon us. And that curse did not stop with the first century. It is still upon them, and they are still you know, making those outlandish you know, uh, statements of saying that Jesus was just a good moral teacher, and they will use his name as, you know, as, a, as a cuss word. And they will also you know, read out the Talmud, which I told you last week, which refers to uh, Mary, as being, uh, uh, Mary as being a whore and that Jesus is the bastard son of Mary, and that Jesus right now is burning in hell in his own excrement. If you don't know what excrement is, his own waste, his own fecal matter, his own feces. So if we want to sit there and say that this little story is a little bit out there, because she's a virgin, and that's how God chose to do it, then we call into question and we should just say, you know what, we'll just live like everybody else, Right? Just because someone may think that it's impossible doesn't make it impossible. There have been many a times where I've heard you know, somebody come back and say, hey, I was in a car accident, but praise the Lord, he kept me safe because I should have been dead and I'm alive. Or I think, of, I think you know, uh, there's a lot of people you know, that you know, maybe you know, with, even with Annie were going, well, she's lost her sight. She's kind of going to get that back. She's going to be forever blind. And yet, lo and behold, the Lord is working. If we want to sit there and say, just because you know, God chose to do it this way, that it's impossible? Last time I checked, God's word says, with God, all things are possible. It doesn't make it impossible or inconsequential. Some people think that they can accept certain parts of the Bible and delete or believe in other parts. There's actually a very, pretty famous, a very famous or pretty famous person that actually believed this way. They believe that they could take away the, uh, the miraculous parts of the Bible because those are hard to believe. We'll just go off the moral teachings of Jesus. You know, his life and the morals and everything that he set, we're just going to follow those. We'll get rid of, and they actually, in here, uh, the portion I'm going to read, you're going to you know, listen to it, actually took a razor blade and began to cut out those parts that were miraculous. Now, what does the Bible say? about those that will take away from God's word? That they'll have their part in every, every plague that the Bible you know, speaks of? That man, you may have heard of him before, Thomas Jefferson. His book uh, that he had titled uh, the, Life and Morals of, uh, uh, the Life and Morals of Jesus of Nazareth, commonly referred to as the Jefferson Bible, is, and this is from Wikipedia, is one of the two religious works constructed by Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson compiled the manuscripts, but never published them. So for that first one, the, uh, sorry, uh, this next one it says, the first, the philosophy of Jesus uh, of Nazareth was co- uh, completed in 1804, but no copies exist today. The second, the life and morals of Jesus of Nazareth was completed in 1820 by cutting and pasting with a razor and glue uh, and glue numerous sections of the, from, the Old Te- uh, from the New Testament as extractions of the doctrine of Jesus. Jefferson's condensed uh, composition ex- excludes all miracles by Jesus and uh, most mentions of the supernatural, including the sections of the four Gospels that contain the resurrection and most other miracles, uh, about miracles and passages that portray Jesus as divine. If necessary, to exclude the miraculous, Jefferson would cut the text even in mid-verse. A historian explained that if a moral lesson was embedded in a miracle, the lesson survived in Jeff- uh, Jeffersonian scripture. That's a problem right there, isn't it? 
because he ain't the one who's supposed to be writing scripture. But the miracle did not. Even when, uh, even when uh, the, uh, this took some rather careful cutting with scissors and a, or a razor, Jefferson uh, managed to maintain Jesus' role as a great moral teacher, but not as, uh, not a, as a divine, uh, divine being or a faith healer. Because Jefferson could never get to that point, you know what, he liked the teachings of Jesus, he didn't like the miracles. You can't accept the parts that you, know, that you like about Jesus and discard the ones that you don't. You either believe all of it or you believe none of it. And it doesn't, and here's the other, you know, argument people will make about the fact of Mary, you know, uh, whether or not she's a virgin or not, is the fact that they'll say, well, Mary, I mean, sorry, you know, that whole virgin story, it's only mentioned twice in Scripture. But it doesn't matter how many times it's mentioned in the Bible for it to be important. The, the frequency of, of teaching or, or narrative doesn't determine its truth, historicity, or it, even its relevancy. We don't need to sit there and say, you know what, just because it happened twice or just because it was said twice means it makes it less valid than something that's mentioned many a times. Because that's what some people will do. Well, like, oh, well, it was only mentioned a couple of times and kind of in passing. No, if it's important, you know, if it's important in the Bible, God said it, we should read it and believe it. It doesn't matter. I mean, who are we to sit there and dissect God's word and say, I don't think that that is really important. I don't think I really need to believe that. That's why I say when you come across something and you don't like what it says in the Bible, that doesn't mean you take a Sharpie and cross it out. That means, you know, you say, Lord, I'm lacking in this area. Help me, Lord, in this area that I have a problem with because your word is truth. You know, I lie. I'm no good. I need to change. Amen? God's word doesn't change. We change. The account of, of Christ's virgin birth is mentioned, like I said, is mentioned in the Bible twice, but if it's in the Bible, it's important no matter what. Both Matthew, uh, Matthew and Luke mention it. Uh, Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 mentions it, and Luke chapter uh, uh, 1, verse 27 and 34 mention it. Because Jesus was miraculously conceived by the Holy Spirit, we see that in Luke chapter uh, 1, verse 35, he had a human mother but not a human father. Due to his unique conception, Jesus, as the baby in the major, was 100% God and 100% man. We need to realize that also because I, I, I know that um, there are certain Bibles out there that will mention the fact of Joseph being Jesus' father. He is not. At best, he's his stepfather. And we need to realize what, the, you know, what people are trying to change and stuff like that in, uh, in modern day uh, stuff. And some people say, well, I just know it. It's already inferred. No, if, if somebody's changing what the Bible says, you may know it. You may understand it. But what about the next generation that comes across it and reads it and goes, well, you know what? My grandparents, my parents were wrong. Jesus, you know, uh, you know Jesus did have a father, a human father, and it was Joseph. And you're like, no. The Bible says that God, you know, that he was conceived of the Holy Spirit, Mary, the human, you know, the, the human mother, but there's the, 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 there was no human father, which the father is, is God himself, amen? Hope I made that clear. But it's one of those things that we need to understand. So, but if Jesus was not born of a virgin, if Joseph or another human man was his father, how could he be the God-man? If he was not conceived of the Holy Spirit, how can he be 100% God and 100% man. He can't. And that's what we need to realize, you know, in this. And if he's not, you know, the God man, the perfect acceptable uh, the perfect and acceptable sacrifice for our sin, how are we saved? You can't be saved by a human. The virgin birth is not a side you know, some side issue that may or not uh, may or may not be believed by by Christians. It's an historical event that is foundational to the gospel. We need to realize that virgin birth is essential to the Bible, essential to the gospel. We cannot sit there and say, you know what, well, we can agree to disagree. No, it's a, there's no agreeing to disagree on this. It's what the Bible says. 
You may want to say, well, that seems a little bit out there. What does the Bible say? If we believe that the Word of God is the Word of God, that it's 100% true, then we can't say, well, that's yeah, because then it's like 99.9%. And then, like I say, what else can we sit there and say, well, that seems a little bit far fetched? I mean, think about it. Think about the Old Testament miracles that happened. The parting of the Red Sea. I heard Ben Shapiro make this comment. And, you know, he's a well known Jewish talk show host. They asked him about it. And he says, well, it says right there, there's, there's a natural phenomenon. That there was a strong east wind that came and blew it up. So there's, there's a natural phenomenon. God did not, you know, there was, that's a nice fairy tale, but it, it explains it right there. It says there was an east wind that came and blew it up. That there was, there was, God was not involved in that. It was nature. That's what you're going to start to have. You have people that will sit there at the walls of Jericho. That seems a little far-fetched. The walls will just fall down because somebody yelled or a group of people you know, started yelling. And they went around it seven times. You know, and they'll sit there and say, well, that's just what... But yet, they have found the ruins of Jericho. And they didn't just fall down. The ruins that they found, uh, found were actually... They, it looked like, you know, they said it looked like somebody like pushed them straight down into the ground. How do you do that? I don't care how much weight you lift... You can't be, you, I, can't even, I can't even push a little pebble into the ground without it hurting, let alone some big old huge bricks for you know, an entire city. But that's what you're dealing with when you have people that question what God's word and say, that's a fairy tale, those are all just nice little stories. I, I prefer to stay to the moral teachings of Jesus. You're in the same boat that Jefferson is. And just, uh, in Jefferson, if he did not change his you know, viewpoint, which I don't, I've never heard him ever changing his viewpoint, is burning in hell right now. Because you don't take away from God's word. Just because it's not convenient for you. Amen? So now let's go back to Matthew chapter 1. And I want us to read the account of Jesus' birth again. And hopefully maybe we'll have a deeper appreciation you know, uh, for the Christmas story. That we just don't read it, we don't just glance over the virgin birth, but we actually have a deeper appreciation for the Christmas story. Let's start at uh, Matthew chapter 1. Let's start at verse 18 and through the end of the chapter. It says, Now the birth of Jesus was on the wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before uh, they came together, she was found with child, of, with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public uh, example, was minded to put her away uh, privily or privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all, all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall uh, be with child, and shall bring forth a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is being interpreted, God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and he took unto him his wife, and knew her not. That right there, knew her not, is we know from like Adam and even other stories that they, they were not together physically as in a marriage relationship. And knew her not till he had, uh, till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. So when we read that, know that the Bible says what it means and means what it says. That we don't sit there and, you know, and call into question God's word. What we need to call into question is our, is our motives and, 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 and what we're going through because God you know, is the one that knows us better than us. Amen? That's the reason why when you read God's word and you read over a passage hundreds of times, all of a sudden that 101st time, it, it, just, it just strikes you differently. 
Because why? The Bible is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, right? It's going to go down to the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. It's going to get right to the crux of the whole thing. That's why I find it funny when somebody, when somebody afterwards will come up to me you know, from a sermon and say, Pastor, how did you know? I say, how do I know what? I had that happen a few weeks ago where somebody came up to me and said, Pastor, how did you know? And I said, I, don't know. I, I had no idea what they were talking about. And they began to tell me. And I said, I had no idea. I said, it must have been the Lord. I'm not trying to like brag or anything because it had nothing to do with me. It's God's word that is, is pricking the hearts of people. And that's what we need to realize is God's word that changes people. It's God's word that, you know, gives us everything that we need to know for life and how to live godly. Amen? Amen. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. God, I thank you that you came in the way that you came. Whereas I would sit there and think of there would be so much more, you know, uh, uh, better ways to uh, you know, for a king, you know, uh, the king of kings and the lords, uh, the Lord of lords to come and, 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 and maybe to sit there and, and think, hey, you know what? I may have been along the lines of thinking, uh, along the lines of like, maybe the Pharisees and everything else, that you should come in grandeur and glory. But you said, no, I'm going to come in the form of a helpless baby. God, we thank you. And the fact that the miraculous didn't stop in the Old Testament. It went on through the, the New Testament. Why? Because every miraculous thing that happens, every single word from the word is meant to speak to us. Your word does not change, but we need to change and be conformed into your image. And so, Lord, I thank you for every single person that has come here this morning to hear your word. Lord, I pray as you have brought them here safely, I ask that you would take them home safely. In Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, tonight we have uh, we have a, a prayer and we have uh, first uh, youth as well. That'll be at five o'clock. Uh, God bless you. You are dismissed.